Good morning everyone and welcome to New Season Church. My name is Brian and along with my wife Samantha we lead and pastor New Season Church. And the mission of our church really is threefold. It's number one, to help you find God. Find out what is your identity in Him and develop a real relationship with Him. Number two, discover your purpose. What has God called you to do and what are the things that God uh, has given you and the gifts that God has given you to pursue that calling. And ultimately, number three, to help you make a difference in the world around you through the message of grace and the kingdom. So we want to thank you for choosing us as your place of worship. And if you're new this morning, we want to send out a special warm welcome to you. And we'd like to ask you that you let us know that you're joining us for the first time this morning by following the link in the description. Uh, we'd like to touch base with you during the week. And thank you personally for joining us and also see how better we can serve you. Parents, uh, our Kids Church resources are available for you to make use of during this time that we aren't able to meet in person. And during this time that there's uh, no Kids Church, uh, physical ch Kids Church available uh, for your children, we'd like to encourage you that you make use of our curriculum and that you make use of those resources to still foster and develop your children's uh, spiritual growth during this time. If you haven't liked our Facebook page yet, we'd like to encourage you to do so by clicking like. Uh, in this way, you'll be able to stay engaged with us, especially during the course of the week. Uh, for example, on a Tuesday night, we have what we call Encore, which is an opportunity for us to engage uh, in, in, in a more deeper way in terms of the message and really see how better we can apply the lessons that we will learn uh, through God's Word on a Sunday morning into the rest of our life. Uh, during the week. So we encourage you to like our page and also join us uh, on, on, on Tuesday nights. If you'd like to follow along with my sermon notes, they're available for, for you to download from the Version Bible app. You can access those by following the link in the description below the video and you'll be able to have uh, access to all my sermon notes as well as all the Bible references that you can use for further study. And finally, if you like to listen to our messages uh, on MP3, they're available for you to download or listen to online from our website. You can follow the link, uh, go to our website, newseasonchurch.co.za, and you can uh, download or listen to all of our messages uh, for free. Well, join me this morning in prayer. Father, we come to in the name of Jesus, Father God, and we're just so thankful, Lord, for another day, Father, this morning. We're so thankful this morning that we have the opportunity to gather around your word, that we have the opportunity, Father God, to be gathered in your name. 
And we thank you as we do that this morning, that you are right here, that you are in our midst, Father God. Holy Spirit, thank you that you teach us this morning, that you counsel us, that you advise us, that you open up the word to us uh, this morning. Thank you for fresh revelation of the mysteries of your kingdom. Thank you for fresh revelation of who Jesus is. As we've been going through the book of John and really seeing the person of Christ and his divinity. Father, we thank you that we have a fresh revelation, a fresh understanding who Jesus is. That we will break religious molds and we will break religious images and ideas of who he is. And really see him for the true God and his true nature. So we thank you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to be carrying on with our series called Come and See. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the divinity of Christ as, uh, as we've been taking a journey through the book of John. And we've been looking at this concept and the idea and really the ultimate truth that Jesus really was God and he really was human, that God, he was God incarnate in human form. And in week one, we looked at how Jesus' divinity is shown through his eternal existence. That Jesus really was the Logos of God, the intelligence of God, the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And ultimately, that Jesus is God and is worthy of our devotion and our worship. Last week, we looked at how Jesus' divinity is shown through his ability to offer forgiveness and salvation. And that really what God is not looking for is a moral reformation. God's not looking for us to get right, to sort ourselves out. Uh, he's not looking for a reordering of who we already are. But He's really looking for a heart transformation. That He's looking for us to open up our hearts to Him. And so that He can speak to us, that we are receptive to Him. And that as we receive Him, then what flows out of that is acts of goodness, acts of kindness, and acts of righteousness. And this morning, uh, as I was preparing for my message uh, for, for today, I was wondering uh, to myself and looking at how often I examine uh, my level uh, of the relationship that I have with God. Where am I, where am I with, with God? At what level am I on? And, and one of the things I was thinking of uh, about was whether my relationship with God affects the way that I experience Him. I wonder if you've ever thought about where you are with God and the, the place where you are at with Him, whether that affects how you experience Him. Does God only reveal Himself to us when we are at a certain spiritual level, a certain level of maturity or a certain spiritual plane. Is God's revealing of Himself or His breakthroughs, His miracles, uh, the realization of His promises, are those things only reserved for a specific few people that are at a specific point in their journey with God? Is God constantly waiting for us to get to a certain point with Him before we can actually see the breakthrough, before we can actually see miracle, before we can see the realization of God's promises? And if that is true, if, if, we are, if God is waiting for us to get to a certain point, then what happens to the rest of us? And how do we get to that point? You know, if, 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 if breakthrough is only for a specific few people, that have already gotten to that place, then what do the rest of us do? And if we need to get to that place, how do we get there? And so this morning I want to really look at this idea of, does God wait for us to get to a certain place before He shows grace to us, before He uh, allows us to walk in breakthrough or realization of, of His promises? Or can God meet us at the place where we're at? Is there more to God's grace and His mercy than what we assume or what we uh, perceive at the point where we're at? And this morning I want to look at an account of a man born blind. And uh, we're going to pick it up in John uh, chapter 9 verse 2. And it says, His disciples asked Him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
And so to put it into context, the disciples are walking with Jesus and they come across a man and he's blind and he's, and he's born blind. And they ask the question, what is the reason for this man's blindness? Was it that his parents sinned or was it that he sinned? And to understand this question, we need to understand that during that time, it was widely considered that calamity, that challenge, that tragedy is a direct result of sin. That it is a direct result of someone in that family, someone, either that person or the parents sinning. And because of that sin is now the result. During that time, in essence, there was no death without sin. And there was no suffering without iniquity. That every single challenge and tragedy that someone is experiencing was as a direct result of the sin in their life. And so the disciples are looking at this person and they're saying, Well, Jesus, tell us, is it the man that, that, that sinned or is it the parents? And what's interesting to me here is that the disciples uh, had no regard for the man. All they wanted to know was who sinned. All they wanted to do is to be able to solve a, theolo a theological puzzle. The man was not someone to be helped, but he was, a, he, was a, he was a puzzle to be solved. And isn't that what we often do as well? Isn't that how we look at our tragedies and our, and our challenges? That we will look at uh, something that's happened in our life, we will look at a calamity in our life, and we will immediately go to, what did I do wrong? What did I, what, is there sin in my life? What, what did I do? What, what caused this thing to happen in my life? We often go into analytical mode when we are faced with a challenge, when we are faced with a tragedy, where we really can't find uh, a direct reason would we'll look for what did we do wrong or what did that person do wrong. And so in response to the, to the question, Jesus responds to his disciples in verse 3 and it says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works for him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus responds to this question without even answering it. See, Jesus showed a different way. While the disciples were trying to figure out who was at fault here, Jesus was more concerned about helping the man uh, as opposed to solving some theological puzzle. And so Jesus firstly debunks the idea that this man's blindness, this man's tragedy and calamity is due to his or his parents' sin. In this case, Jesus, what, what he was really saying was that this was a result of sin and the brokenness in our world in, ge uh, in general. That Adam set in motion through his sin, set in motion of death and destruction in the world that we still have to deal with today. What we need to realize is that we live in a broken world. And that brokenness infiltrates every area of our life. And so it's not all the time that the things that we experience and the tragedies and the, and the, 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 the calamities that we experience in our lives as a direct result of something that we have done wrong. Yes, there are consequences to our actions. But in this case, what Jesus was saying was, look, this is not uh, as a result of him or his parents' sin. This is not as a result of his or his parents' sin. This, he said, is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, this does not mean that God deliberately put blindness or, or sickness on the man. So that after a couple of years, when God removes the, the blindness, uh, he, he's, 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 he, he will be glorified. That's not what it means. And that's not what Jesus is saying. And to, 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 to assume that would be really to throw aspersion to God's character. What it does mean is that God overruled the disaster of the child's blindness in his life. That when the child grew to manhood and would, would encounter Jesus, 
that his sight would be restored and he would see Jesus face to face as God and others seeing this would see it as an act of God and as an act of God's mercy and would turn to the light of the world. And Jesus makes the statement that says, Night is coming when no one can work. And this account was taking place on the Sabbath. And Jesus was in essence saying, Look, night is coming. The Sabbath is coming where in essence I won't be able to work. He had just come from being almost stoned. And now he's, he's confronted with, with a man born of blindness. And he's saying to, to his disciples, I still have to do something about this. And he knew that if he had performed the miracle, if he had performed any kind of healing, that would add fuel to the fire and the religious leaders, his opposition would pursue him even more aggressively. But Jesus' compassion for the man drove him to do it anyway. And we see what happens uh, in verse 6 and it says, After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. And he came home seeing. That one statement, that one phrase, and he came home seeing, is so powerful. Because at this point, up until this point, there had been no record of anyone ever uh, being born blind, having their sight restored. This is the first record in the whole of the Bible that we see someone's sight being restored when they when, when they had been born blind. From Genesis to John, there had not been a prophet, a priest, an apostle who had restored sight in this way that Jesus did. And in this in this act of restoring uh, sight to the blind, Jesus proves His divinity. Because the restoration of sight was something that was reserved and it was prophesied for and about the Messiah. We see it in, the, in, in Psalms and we see it in Isaiah as He speaks of, and the Lord opens their eyes. The act of Jesus restoring sight proved His divinity, proved that He was God. And he was human at the same time. And he really was God incarnate. But this statement, and he came home seeing, is powerful for another reason. It's powerful because it shows that Jesus took the initiative. The Bible tells us, this account tells us that they were walking around. Jesus was walking around with disciples. They see a man born blind and they start to talk about and, and debate why is he blind. And Jesus says, no, it's not his, his sin, nor is it his parents' sin. But this is so that the works of God and the glory of God may be, uh, may be seen in his life. And he puts, takes mud, puts it on his eyes and he tells the man, go, go, uh, go and wash it off in the pool. At no point did the man go to Jesus. At no point did the man pursue Jesus. He didn't even know who this person was. All he knew was that there was a man in front of him putting mud on his eyes and telling him to wash it off. And there was a level of faith. Even though Jesus never promised the man that he would have healing. He never said anything. He just put mud on his, on his eyes. He never told the man, I am God. He never told the man, now go and wash it off and you'll see. He never promised them anything. Even though to a certain extent it might have been implied. The man took no initiative apart from going to the pool. That even still had to take a little bit of faith. He had to walk to the pool. He had to walk down the stairs. And he had to wash it off. There was a certain level of faith and obedience that the man responded in to Jesus putting the mud on his eyes. And so we see in that one statement something very powerful. And he came home seeing Jesus' divinity and Jesus' pursuit of the man. And so now we see the man is healed and now the, the questioning starts. The religious opposition comes and they start to question him. And we find that in John 9 verse 10. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. 
He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. Verse 17. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. At this point, we see that now the, 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 the news has gotten around. And we see the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are questioning the man healed. What happened? How did you do it? Who was this person? And even at, 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 in this exchange, they're questioning him. They're questioning him. They're questioning his parents. And they're in essence trying to get him to, to recant his, his, uh, his experience. They're trying to get him to say that Jesus is a sinner. And so they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They, they, they countless, you know, uh, debate about who he is. And eventually the man in verse 25 replies and he says, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. The man had an encounter with Jesus that completely changed his life. This man was not a scholar. He was not a religious leader. In fact, the religious leaders at the end of this, at the end of this exchange with him, excommunicated him out of the synagogue. They threw him out. They abused him. They rejected him. And they threw him out. They insulted him. They called him a liar. But he had an encounter with Jesus that completely changed his life. He knew nothing of Jesus. He, who knew, he was not versed in theology. He was not on some specific spiritual plane that he needed to be in order to receive a miracle, to receive his breakthrough, to receive the the, the fullness of God. He received his breakthrough before he even knew who Jesus was. And Jesus met the man at the place and at the level that he was at. See, the man moves from knowing the person. He said, who is this? A man. To knowing him as Jesus, a man called Jesus. To then declaring him as a prophet. The man moved progressively in his understanding of who Jesus was. But remember, at this point, he still had not seen Jesus face to face. He had encountered him. Jesus had healed him. The man had a greater understanding and a progressive knowledge or what we will call revelation of who Jesus was because of the effect that he had on his life. I was blind, but now I see. And even at this point, he still had not seen Jesus face to face. And so this man is thrown out. He's excommunicated out of the synagogue. And we see a, 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 a discourse, an account of a conversation that Jesus has with him. It's found in verse 35 and it says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may, know, may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And he found him. Once again, we see Jesus take the initiative and find the man. You see, Jesus, when he put the mud on the man's eyes and told him to go to the pool, he never said to him, once you have been to the pool and once you have washed the mud off your face, come and find me. No, Jesus put the mud on his eyes and he left. And when he heard that the man had been thrown out of the synagogue, when, when he heard that the man had been rejected, when Others had said, that is not true. That was not a miracle. You didn't have a breakthrough. Jesus goes out and searches the man out again. He goes and he takes the initiative to find the man again. 
And he finds him and he asks him a simple question. He says, in light of your encounter, in light of what you experienced, you were blind, but now you see. Do you believe in the Son of God? And the man standing in front of Jesus says, who is it? Who is this, this, this Son of God that you, that you are talking about? He still cannot recognize Jesus. Jesus is standing face to face with him and he still can't recognize him. And Jesus says, I am the Son of God. It is me. And the man's response is, Lord, I believe. The man had an encounter with Jesus before even knowing who Jesus was. His knowledge of him progressed from a man to a man called Jesus to a prophet and ultimately to Lord. What's amazing is not just the fact that Jesus healed the man. What's amazing is that Jesus pursued the man. Jesus searched the man out. Jesus met the man at the level that he was at. He met him at every single stage of his journey. And he called him to greater intimacy and knowledge of him. The man moved in progression in the knowledge of who Jesus was. He started as Jesus is a man. And he moved to Jesus is a prophet. He then moved to Jesus is my master and I am his disciple. He then moved to Jesus is from God. Then to Jesus is the son of God. Then Jesus is who I trust. And ultimately Jesus is who I worship. The man ultimately recognized Jesus as the son of God, his Lord. And the only response was to worship Him. And in the same way that Jesus met the man at the level that He was at, Jesus still does this today. He meets you and I at the very level that we are at. at. That His grace and His favor and His breakthroughs and His miracles are not, are not reserved for a select few, always blessed, never stressed people they're available to every single one of us at the level that we are at that God is not waiting for us to get to some spiritual uh, plane some higher level of enlightenment before he reveals himself to us but he reveals himself to us progressively that Jesus' divinity is not only shown in the fact that He heals and He performs miracles as the Messiah, as the Son of God. But His divinity is also shown to us through the way that He progressively allows Himself to be known to us. That at every stage and every level of our walk with Him, He is revealing Himself to us and He is meeting us at the level that we're at. And ultimately, He calls us into greater intimacy and greater knowledge of Him. And so I want to encourage you this morning. That it doesn't matter where, what you are going through. That God will meet you at the place that you're at. That God will meet you at the level that you're at. That God will pursue you. And He will search you out up until the point that you recognize Him as God and that your only response is to worship Him. And I know that some of you have been going through some difficult times and different challenges and some really some tragedies in your life. I want you to know that sometimes we don't have an answer and we don't have a reason for those things. That sometimes the only reason is that we live in a broken world. But we can have hope in this very simple fact that God will meet us at the place where we're at. And God will reveal Himself to us. And God will perform a miracle in our lives at the place where we're at. So I want to pray for you this morning. Those of you that are trusting for a breakthrough, trusting for a miracle in your life. I want to pray for you and I want us to partner our faith together. 
that as we turn to God who is full of grace, mercy, that we will see Him as one that loves us and loves us unconditionally, that He will never put us in a place where He will not provide a way of escape for us. And I want to pray for you this morning. So if that's you this morning, if you're saying, look, I, I, I need a breakthrough in my life, just stand in agreement this morning with me. And let's put our faith together and let's put our trust in God's grace and mercy for our life. So pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you this morning for every single person that is watching this message. Father, I thank you that you are God of grace and mercy. That you meet us at the place and the level that we're at. That Father God, that your favor and your miracles and your breakthroughs, uh, breakthroughs are not reserved for a select few. But Father God, you shower your grace and your love upon every single one of us. Father, that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask for, for or imagine. So this morning, Father God, I pray for every single person that is trusting you for a breakthrough, for a miracle in their lives. Father, I ask that you will respond to that call, that you will hear them, Father God, that you will embrace them and that you will give them what they need in this time. Father, we also understand that sometimes what we think we need is not, in fact, the very thing that we are in need of. So, Father, we thank you that we can put our trust in you this morning. That, Father, God, you will supply all of our needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. That ultimately you never leave us nor forsake us. Then that you're with us till the ends of the age. This morning, I want to invite you into a relationship with God if, you've, if you don't have one. And I want to invite you to create an intimacy with Him. So repeat this prayer with me. Father God, come to the name of Jesus. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died on the cross and He was raised three days later. I recognize Him as the Son of God and I worship Him now. Show me your ways that I may know you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer this morning and you accepted Jesus as the Son of God and accepted Him as your Lord this morning, we want to say well done and welcome to the family. And we're so excited for you. It's the beginning of a great journey and a great life. And so we like to support you as much as we can and want to uh, walk that journey with you. And so we're going to ask you that you let us know uh, this, that you accepted Jesus this morning by following the link in the description and we'd like to send you some resources that you can use that will equip you, that will grow your faith and will help you as you begin this wonderful journey. So once again, well done and we're so excited for you. Well, it's the first Sunday of the month this morning and uh, we're going to be taking up communion this morning so I encourage you to get your communion elements ready as we uh, partake of uh, the communion uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ together and as a family. And the two communion elements are the bread and the wine. Or in our case, we use a cracker and grape juice. And the bread represents the body of Christ. The word says that His body was broken, that ours may be whole. He was made poor, that we may become rich. That our iniquities were placed upon Him, that He took upon our punishment. And so when we take communion, we are doing this in remembrance of Him. That we are doing it in remembrance of what the cross means and meant for us. That it's not just a symbol of our faith, but it's a direct and powerful representation of the work of God in our life. That on the cross, there was a great exchange that happened. That Jesus paid for the punishment of us and He took upon Himself our iniquities, our sins, and He gave to us His righteousness. That He took upon Himself our sickness and disease and He gave to us His health, <clears throat> excuse me, His health and His uh, uh, healing. That He took upon Himself on the cross our, our depression, our anxiety and He gave us His joy 
and His peace. And so as we partake of the bread, we are partaking of life. The Word says that He is the bread of life. That we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of His mouth. So as we partake of the bread, remember that we are partaking of life. We are receiving the Zoe life, the abundant life, the life as God has it. And if you're trusting for breakthrough or miracle this morning, we're going to partner our faith and we're going to declare the finished work of, of Christ on the cross. And that we have direct access into God's favor and His provision because of the work on the cross. Communion is not just a symbol. It is powerful representation of the cross and the work that was done on the cross. And by faith, we receive it right now. So let's pray. Father, we thank You for the powerful communion elements. That as we partake of the bread, it represents the body of Christ broken for us, Father God. The, our, our sins were placed upon Him and He was beaten to death because of that. And Father, we thank You that because of His obedience, we have direct access into Your throne of grace where we find help in time of need. So Father, this morning, we thank You for breakthrough in, pro, in provision. We thank You for breakthrough in health this morning. Father, we thank You that every single person that is dealing with anxiety, stress, and depression, the, the bondage of that and the chains of that is broken right now in the name of Jesus. Depression has no right over your people. Anxiety, stress has no right over them. And as we partake of the bread that represents the bread of life, the Zoe life, the God kind of life, we receive freedom right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the juice that represents the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that the blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sin and the doing away of our sin. And the covenant we have with you, the agreement, the, the binding that we have with you was confirmed and ratified by the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you that there's life in the blood. As we partake of this juice, we are partaking of life to our minds, to our bodies, to our families, to our relationships, to our church, to our businesses, to our homes. Every single area of our life flows with your abundant life in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and partake. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, as I wrap up the service this morning, I will be taking up the offering this morning. And I'm reading from Malachi 3. 10 to 11 and it says bring all the tithes the whole tenth of your income into the stores that there may be food in my house and prove me now by it says the Lord of hosts if I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer insects and plagues for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground neither shall your vine drop its fruit before the time in the field says the Lord of hosts so in this scripture we see two things about the tithe we see number one provision that God will abundantly supply his provision to us he says that if we bring our tithes if we honor him with 10% of our income he will open up the gates of heaven and pour it a blessing that we will have not enough room to contain it that's the first thing so he promises provision and secondly there is protection of the provision that he says, look, when you, when you bring your tithe, when you honor me, what I will do is I will chase away. God says he himself will rebuke. He, will, he himself will chase away the devourer. Those things that will aim to produce loss in your life. And so he says, when you honor me, 
I honor you. When you seek me diligently, I reward you. I stand behind my word to perform it. And I want to encourage you this morning, as you give your tithe, as you give your offering, to remind yourself and to keep these promises close to you. The God will supply your needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. And He will protect that provision. And we've seen this play out time and time again in our church. And even more recently during the lockdown. We have people that have, that have been supernaturally blessed. That have had supernatural provision during lockdown. That they've, they've, they've increased financially more in the time of lockdown where there was heavy business restrictions. They've increased more during lockdown than what they, what they had during the four months prior to the lockdown. Why? Because God stands behind His word to perform it. He says, if you will do this, I have no choice but to follow my word. And He says, when you give, you shall receive. When you bring your tithe. I'll pour it a blessing and I will protect that blessing. So this morning as you give or you have given already, you can do so uh, by following the details that will be on the screen. You can use Snapscan or, or, or PayFast. All the details are on our website, newseasonchurch.co.za. And if you'd like to support the pantry, you can also do that. Just make sure that the reference is pantry so we know that we can allocate it to that initiative. Well, let's pray over the offering this morning. Father, I thank you this morning for the seed to sow into your kingdom. We thank you for the power of the tithe. We thank you that as we tithe, as we give into your kingdom, Father God, that there is provision, abundant provision, Father God, in our lives. That there is a blessing that is being poured out that we cannot contain it. And secondly, that there is protection over that blessing father we thank you that you personally rebuke the devour on our behalf that no loss comes near our dwelling place in the mighty name of jesus amen amen everybody thanks for joining us this morning as i close the service i want to bless you with the scripture from numbers 6 24 to 26 and it says the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace i trust that you were encouraged this morning i trust that you will go into this week knowing that no matter what level you find yourself in or what stage of the journey you find yourself with god that god will meet you at the place you're in and his grace his mercy and his favor is available to you today in the mighty name of jesus god bless you remember to invite someone new next week Use the graphics that are on our Facebook page. Use this video. Share it. Put it on your timeline. Let the people that you know, know the grace and the love that we have in Jesus Christ. And if you are being encouraged, if you are being strengthened through these messages, I'm sure somebody in your life is, will, will need the same. So go ahead. Help us. Let's build together. Share, share it and have some more new people next week. God bless you. Uh, join us on uh, Tuesday night. Uh, 7 o'clock encore. Otherwise, we'll see you next week, Sunday, 9 a.m. God bless you.